Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Demartini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Wow, everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome. Um... As with many of us, you know, we mourn the passing of what uh, many call one of the greats. And, uh, you know, we're talking about President Bush. And so for those of us here that went through and had been part of his journey, our life's journey, um, and certainly for many of us who had parents that, you know, looked at who he was and talked openly, at least my mom and my dad did, about what he stood for. You know, early on as, as, as young adults, we got to really have a sense of the word dignity. And whether you agree with his politics or not, those of us that watched him pass or get past bills that would safeguard those in the country that were disabled. You know, for for many of us, and in my case in particular, working with a, a youngster who was so, so very special and yet disabled and looking at how the country then treated people and then how he was instrumental in changing that. And so politics aside, our hearts go out to the family. Uh, and we take a moment today to acknowledge that. It's important to acknowledge those that have passed on um, in many, many ways. You, you know, you all have heard me talk about my mom's suicide. And um, at the point in time back in the day when we didn't talk about addiction and we didn't talk about alcoholism, um, my mom's first attempt at suicide failed. The second time uh, she decided, I'm just going to light the house on fire. Uh, then you heard me talk about my sister who, you know, in her own way, um, struggled for her entire life. Uh, and then you also heard me share about how several years ago, my last two sisters uh, were buried. Um, and the thread between all of that is understanding the key essence of what happens to a soul who's absolutely struggling to be here on this planet in this earth skin. And the solution for many are numbing oneself, are, are ways to be able to be here and be here. But for those of you, sometimes we lose people that are close to us, and yet we know we haven't lost them. My Search for Christopher on the Other Side book, a book that we're going to talk about today, but more of a journey by Joe McQuillan. You know, here he is, probably like many of us, never thought in a million years that we would be talking about our loved ones, that you would outlast your children in this life. But today, today we get to talk with Joe about his journey and what it was about his absolute connection with what it means to knowledge there is another side but how important that became for him. He's been father of three kids. One is on the other side. Uh, he's the youngest children, an Irish Catholic family. And so 
from Chicago, uh, but, you know, blue collar kid from Buffalo, New York. We have a lot in, co in common. And yet at the same time, here we are today where he has put his heart on the line. And because it is with his love and his passion and his purpose for his message that we get to talk to him today about this and so much more. Now, I will say coming out of the gate, this is going to be quite controversial because the age old who has the better pizza, New York or Chicago, may come up. Joe, great to have you. Hi, Dr. Pat. How are you? I'm not even going to bring up the pizza thing. Well, I got to a... tell you something. Okay. I'm from Buffalo. So when I got to Chicago, and they were <laughs> serving pizza in squares or this big deep dish stuff. I had no idea what it was. It was fine food. It just wasn't pizza. That's right. So I'm falling down on your side on this argument. Dr. Okay, good. That's good. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, Joe, thank you so much for, for joining me here today for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, it took me a long time. This is my 15th year. Uh, January starts our 15th year with the Dr. Pat show. And it took me a really long time to talk about my mom right. and her passing. It took me a really long time. What was the journey like for you? What was it that happened where you said, I can't be silent about this. Well, you know, a couple things, Dr. Pat. I grew up in the same, you know, mindset era that that you did, where, where, and there's a whole chapter in the book about God calling him home early. Is what they said when my brother took his own life in 1977, and I was down on spring break in Florida, and they had to find me, and which wasn't an easy task, and mm -hmm. uh, and they did, and uh, we never talked about it. The whole family never talked about it. So. Um, you know, typical, you know, you know, Eugene O'Neill tragedies in, in big families that have a string of alcohol that ran through it. So, you know, I had no intention of writing a book when I started keeping copious notes. I was just trying to stay connected to my 21-year-old son who had passed in a, crossed over in a canoe accident with three other boys. They all had been, you know, at the end of a winter vacation and at a beach house and a lake house up in Wisconsin and they'd been drinking all day and jumped in a canoe, which makes total sense to a guy like me at three o'clock in the morning. And mm -hmm. none of them came back. Yeah. So, um, I just had a direct connection with him. I adored my son. We understood each other. I was mm -hmm. kind of a wild kid. He was kind of a wild kid, tender, loving boy. And all of a sudden he wasn't in my presence physically but I needed to find out where he was and how I could connect to him. And that was, that was what this search was. That's what this is about. That's my search for Christopher. And it turns out it was on the other side. And, and Dr. Pat, I wanted to know if this were hokey crap, sorry. Right. <laughs> I wanted to know that too. Right. right. And, you know, and, but the more I dug in and the more I became aware of this whole other world called the afterlife where, where, not just my loved ones are, where our loved ones are, and specifically my Christopher. Mm. So that's what caused me to start this. Well, I, and I, it, look, when I started this show, right, Joe, yeah. um, I, I wasn't sure where I was with whether or not people cross over. I, I really didn't. And, you know, when I got really, really sick six months after this, my whole perspective on life changed. You know, my my own vulnerability and here I was now with a positive talk radio show, by the way, that go back 15 years. I don't even think the word positive was invented. <laughs> but, you know, here we were and it became very important to really seek out what people wanted to know more about. And this is one of those things, you know. Were you as skeptical as I was until my mother showed up in my living room? And I know she passed away when I was six. <laughs> no, you know <laughs> what? I, I, I don't know if I was skeptical, Dr. Pat. Mm -hmm. I, I, didn't, I didn't seek into it. I didn't try to find out. It wasn't pertinent to my life. You know, I've said yes. before that God, I believed in God. I, I went to, you know, 13 years of Catholic school, you know, the 13th, you know, being a, 
private Catholic college near EPA that we parted company for a series of misunderstandings. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that, I got kicked out of Catholic boarding well, school. Well, so did I. <laughs> that, that was a misunderstanding, Pat. And um, they wanted me to go. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I believed in God. I just didn't have a real connection to God. Mm-hmm. You know, I believe in the Secretary of the Interior. I, mm-hmm. I just have no connection with him. Mm-hmm. And, and, and to be real open with you, 32 years ago, I got sober, you know, and I started, that helped me open the door to finding a God. Mm-hmm. So when Christopher crossed over, I believed there was a loving God. I was pretty mad at him, to be honest with you, for yeah. taking my son. And yet what I needed to figure out, and I did, through, through some kind of divine message, I believe, was that God didn't take my son. My son's mm-hmm. recklessness, you know, my son's you know, free will caused him to cross early. You know, God didn't move us around like chess pieces. Christopher made choices, and that resulted in him crossing early. And God was holding me. Mm. You know, when I could barely, you know, when I could barely make it through the night. So, you know, I no longer blamed God. So if God and I are okay, <laughs> and Chris is over uh, on some, you know, area that, 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 part of his domain, I want to get in. I want to figure this out, you know. Yeah. And like you, it sounds like you skipped over, you know, I was sick. It must have been something that was life-changing that caused you yeah. to look at that. Yeah. And I will tell you one thing about this, is that I have zero fear of death. Now, I'm not ready to go. I've got two other kids and a wonderful wife and a, a family and, and responsibilities. But if God were to tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, pal, you know, you're next. You know, I've packed my duffel bag. I'm okay with that. You know, I I know that what's next is substantially better than what we've got here. And my life here is beyond my wildest dreams, right? I've had a, I have a wonderful life that I, I don't deserve. You know, but, but the next life also involves rejoining. You know, you talked with Chris. You talked about um, Bush passing. I yeah. A beautiful cartoon with his wife and daughter who died at, I think, two. Yeah. Greeting him at the, at the pearly gates and said, we've yeah. been waiting for you, you know? Yeah. That's what happens. I believe. In fact, it's not I believe. I know. There's a difference in believing and knowing. There I is know. a big difference. Big. I now know. I started off kind of believing with a healthy dose of skepticism. Now I know. And that's yeah. a gift. Now, to be honest with you, Pat... It's kind of like being, you know, when Lincoln talked about being rode out of town on a rail, if it wasn't for the honor, he'd yeah. rather pass on it. And that's how I felt. I, you know, I would have much preferred having my son around and not going on this journey, you know, and finding out about it when I passed. But that's not how the, the cards were dealt this time. Yeah. You know, it's really for, for many of us, right, we get to have these moments where we look at our lives and we look at uh, uh, things that happen in our lives that forever change us. And this is one of those things. And, you know, it's true. And as I'm reading your book, one of the things I struck by is the Rumi quote. And I want to yeah. talk about this when we come back from break. Right. And it's, it's one of my favorite because for a while, I just looked around and all the women that were close to me just died all of a sudden. You know, my mentor uh, went on a trip in Morocco. And the next thing I know, uh, I was supposed to be on that trip with her car accident and a state goes through her heart. So here's the quote and we'll take a short break. Goodbyes are only for those who love with their eyes because for those who love with heart and soul, there is no such thing as separation. When we come back, We'll talk about that and how that is so, so very true and how the honoring of the passage of of someone so dear is forever in every breath of air we breathe in. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back. Join the new earth on the Cornelia Stephanie show. Tune in each month as Cornelia takes listeners on an odyssey of higher consciousness to inspire, educate, and empower. Cornelia Stephanie is a spiritual teacher, passionate speaker, published author, and founder of the Empower Network. 
Cornelia guides people on the path of self-healing, peace, and liberation. For more information, go to CorneliaStephanie.com. Darcy Pariso is your connection to spirit, energy, and healing. You can meet Darcy in person at upcoming events throughout Seattle. Do you have questions about your animal companions, yourself, or do you desire to communicate with loved ones on the other side? Darcy will connect you and get answers. Darcy can also work with energy healing to help you and your animal companions feel more balanced and recharged. Visit DarcyPariso.com slash events. Are you ready to shift gears from spiritual seeker to spiritual rock star? Let Nova Whiteman be your aligning force that will help you navigate the ups and downs of this human experience. Tune in to Spiritual Alignment Radio with Nova Whiteman every second Tuesday at 12 p.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more, visit NovaWhiteman.com. That's N-O-V-A-W-I-G-H-T-M-A-N.com. People often ask, what does it mean to thrive? On Thrive by Gen Radio, it means body confidence, mind fulfillment, and soul synchronicity. Create synchronicity with God and learn as Jen shares action steps and real stories that will inspire you to be unstoppable in fulfilling your purpose. Tune in live each Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com and visit JenniferZellup.com to thrive with Jen. Hi, I'm Laura Meeks, and the most common problem that my clients face is all work and no play. This is why I created Fly High Living. I help you develop a balanced life plan and guide you to a place where you love to wake up in the morning. Call 888-666-1570 or go to flyhighliving.com to sign up for the four-week Flight Plan for Life course. Have you been searching for a push to step out and share your gifts with the world? Allow Charlene Hess to empower you to start shedding the layers of your ego that are holding you back and begin feeling connected to your heart so that you can shine your unique divine light and share your gifts with the world. Tune in to The Charlene Hess Show, Living on Your Heart's Edge, every third Friday at noon Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit CharleneHess.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm so great to have uh, Joe McQuillan joining me here today. And the reason is his book is called My Search for Christopher on the Other Side. And Benny, we're going to give a copy of the book away today. Um, You know, this is when we think about this and we think about the quote that I just shared, you know, really struck by that quote that you selected. And I want to ask you a little bit about it, uh, if we could, Joe, because uh, unless you read Joe's book, I think today you'll get a sense of what his journey is like. But when you read what, you, Joe, you put on paper, you know, the words on paper, right, you know, the association, you know, that you, you you and I are very similar, except that you're from a dysfunctional Irish family. I'm from right. a dysfunctional Italian family. Yeah, you just got um, better food, that's all. I'm totally better. <laughs> 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 but But that quote, I want to ask you about as you went and embarked on this journey, do you recall at what point a quote like that became meaningful to you? Yeah, you know that's that's outstanding. You know, I I, I do I, I know that I'd always loved Wayne Dyer, and and when mm-hmm. I was started on a, a bit of a spiritual uh, journey, I had a business that was blowing up and it was scaring, and I, and I had been sober and thought I was close to God, yet I had kind of made myself God, and I discovered it's very hard for one God to petition help from another. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, what I had made the most important thing in my life was up in the air. It all worked out, but that fear caused me to run back and find God. And and what I found through books like The Secret and Wayne Dyer, Spiritual Solutions to Other Problems, is that and that the universe requires us to go first. We need to seek Him out and His wisdom. Seek first, you know, the kingdom of of, of God, and the rest will be provided. Right now, I don't quote scripture very often, but you know that caused me to try to find God. So. When Chris 
crossed over and I needed to really connect and find out what's the next move. I had a basis of, 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 of that. So, you know, listening to Wayne Dyer, he had talked about Rumi, so I went and, and wanted some, I needed some wisdom. I needed some, some wisdom through the ages that would help, and so I, would, I went through there. Another wonderful quote, and, it, and you talked about we're being different after our, we've changed our lives, after Christopher left. You know, I'm a much mm. nicer guy. And Henry James, here's a quote from Henry James. Oh, Three yeah. Things in human life are important. The first is to be kind, the second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. You know, kindness, I, I, you know, I didn't realize, you know, how important kindness is in every aspect of our lives. And it's a choice we make. And you, know, <clears throat> you laugh, how, how did I know that my journey with Chris could be summed up in a 50s bebop song? Oh, where, oh, where could my baby be? The Lord oh. took her away from me. She's gone to heaven, oh, yeah. and you've got to be good so I, can be, so I can go to heaven when I leave this world, so I can see my mm-hmm. baby when I leave this world. You know, that yeah. if, 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 the, if, if the condition to connect is be a decent guy, I'm, I'm ponying up. I'm, 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 I'm in. I'm anteing up. I'm going all in. You know, so, so I researched it. I found out about Rumi. I read about some of the other spiritual masters. You know, because mm. I, I want to know. And then I started reading books about the other side. You know, uh, so when Metter wrote a, a book about the, it, just kind of exposed what happens. What, who greets you? How does it work? And, and half of them were almost unreadable, you know, mm-hmm. because they were so dry. And the other, some of them were a little flighty. Um, but I took a little bit from everything, and, and, and I still didn't realize that I was being called to write this book mm-hmm. until what happened was that my sister, my, my, my wife was entertaining her brother, Rick, in our living room and talking about when Chris was two years old and he would play hide and seek and he'd run around and, and, and hide and you'd find him and he'd say hide again and go take off again. And, <clears throat> and uh, she was explaining just how tenacious he was. Mm. And, I, and some reason that just hit me, and I went upstairs and started writing the book, and I had a year's worth of, of notes from mediums and experiences to draw back on, to mm-hmm. use as a basis. And, and that's how the book started. That's where it came from. You know, the part about this that is so important is, and one part about it, Joe, that I want to ask you about is, Somewhere along the line, you and I developed this chutzpah for not giving up on things, right? Some people call it perseverance. My mom, my stepmom called it conviction, yeah. right? Conviction. There's difference. I think there's a fundamental difference um, because conviction has an emotional, passionate energy in it. It's a strength, right, to follow Maybe your gut, maybe your heart, who knows? But as, as I'm reading the book and I'm looking at your journey and your sheer conviction to know, what did the people around you think? You know, it's funny, Pat. One benefit of coming from a dysfunctional, loving Irish Catholic family yeah. is you don't care what everybody thinks. That's right. Right? We had a chip on our shoulder. We, we were yeah. born with a, with a yeah. railroad tie on our shoulder, a chip on our shoulder. And, you know, the neighbors didn't like us. We were, rot- we were hooligans. You know, we yeah. were, you know, we were playing football in the street. And, and so, you know, we had moved to the suburbs, and <laughs> none of the neighbors talked to us, which was pretty good if you're a bad kid because nobody could tell on you. But I grew up not caring about what other people thought other than who I cared about. You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and those I cared dearly about, like my son and my daughter and my other son and my wife and my brother Jerry and Marsha and, you know, the whole family. You know, so I cared about what the tribe thought, but even then only about what the tribe thought when I knew it was right. All I cared about was that, you know, so that's that conviction. I was raised in a way that allowed me to have, I knew I was loved. So I didn't need approval from the outside. So I'm sure this book is coming out and people are going to look at it and say, you know, Jesus, that guy's wacky. You know, and that's just fine. Do your thing, man. You know, figure out, you know, figure it all out on your own. That's great. 
you know, I don't really care about that, right? But I just know that the, what I care about most in this world is my family and my boy on the other side. And so for me to accumulate knowledge, information, experience to touch him, you know, I don't care mm-hmm. what you think. You know, turn off the radio if this offends you. Move on. Yeah. Tell your yeah. story walking. I don't care. God bless you. I don't want any ill will, but I don't need your approval. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I mean, honestly, it's true. The minute that I um, I, I went to uh, Sister Michael Anthony and I pulled on her habit as a six-year-old and said, I'm at the ninth station of the cross, by the way, right? and said, uh, Jesus told me my mom is with him. Then I went to go get, I got pulled by the hair to Mother Superior I right bet there. I you did. I did. And walked in, and Mother Superior had a note because my dad had called. My mom had just passed away. That for me, right, that for me, even as a six-year-old, pointed me in a direction that it took me decades to understand. What for you in thinking about this today, what is it for you not that compelled you to write the book, because I believe I do understand that. But what was, in your words, the most difficult part of writing the book for you? And maybe that has to do with the journey itself, you see. No, it's the writing. You know, it's okay. the writing. Because, mm-hmm. you know, remember, I'm, in, I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. I know how to run from my feelings. You know, ah! um, you know, I can find a distraction. You know, I, I can golf, smoke cigars, you know, drink Red Bull. You know, I can do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the, the, the writing the book, I, I felt Christopher was next to me the entire, every keystroke, Dr. Pat, yeah. he was next to me. I felt him. Yeah. My office at home was his bedroom. So he, he moves freely around there, and I feel him. I truly do. And there's times that I don't, you know, that he's, He's actually said to me, not today, Pop, you know, and, 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 and left me in the middle of meditation with, with nothing. And that's, you know, that's, but that's the way he was in, on this side, too. But there were times, the crazy thing, Dr. Pat, is I was taking these copious notes just for my own benefit, filing them according to date. And so when I was pulling them out a year later and writing them, it, some of it was like the first time I had seen it. And I literally kept a golf towel hung over the railing of my desk because there was times I would just pick it up and wail into it because I missed him so much. You know, I'm reliving events that he had as a kid or what he's telling me. And I had written it down and put it away and, you know, filed it. So reliving that, and, and, you know, and it's like a, a grief tsunami. that It passes. Yeah. You know, it passes. But it's yeah. it's overwhelming, and you just you can't fight it. You know, you just let it pass, and then it, my whole thing was turn it into something good. You yeah. know what? There's specifically men, and and I have this amazing group of friends from AA that are just there's you know guys who run funds and big companies and play NFL football, and mm-hmm. we talk about our feelings and our you know our emotions and our fears, you know, which is which is just this gift that I was given through sobriety. But mm-hmm. most guys don't know what to do with this grief. They don't think it's okay yeah. to buy the support group. They don't think yeah. it's okay to share it. I don't, you know. So, where, where, you know, where I think it's more acceptable for women to do that, to find the outlets, you know, helping parents heal online. You know, there's not a lot of guys out there. You know, so if I can break through to some dads, you know, there was a... Like, Last November, I was at a funeral, uh, a wake. I didn't go to the funeral, a wake. Somebody who le- whose son lost, left, left us early. And I said, you know, he's not gone. You know, he's, he's, it's, you know, it's, he's not gone. And if you ever want to mm-hmm. talk about it, I'd be happy to. You know, there's, you know, and, and by the way, bad trade-off. I'd rather have him here than the story. And I'd rather have him, you know, that, that great hug I would get from him and, and, and hi, Dad, and I love you too. And, you know, those options are, can only communicate from the spirit world now. And I'll take mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I'm with you on that. You know, the the thing, too, is that I, I would go and I want to ask you if you had the same experience. I don't know if you did, 
But I would go and all of a sudden I'd find myself at the uh, tip of Cape Cod in Provincetown in front of a psychic and talking to me about fire. And so yeah. I, about fire. And this is before I actually knew my mom died in a fire because yeah. nobody talked about how my mom died and nobody talked about the fact that she had tried suicide. Do you know how I found out about that, Joe? No. My stepmom was an angel. I'm very, very grateful that I had two incredible women in my life, right? Right. You know, my mom uh, taught me, my birth mom taught me how to be love, and my stepmom taught me how to love life. And so these two women together. So my stepmom, now she had you know what. My dad got these letters from my mom while she was in Bellevue Hospital, had committed suicide. My dad kept the letters from my mother. When my step when my de- my my stepmom made sure those letters were available. And so I got to read those letters. And so here we are now having a story uh what? How many years after she <laughs> passed away? 1987. And yeah. then I hit my I hit up my uncle and I said Uncle Ralph, are you people crazy not telling me this? But the the thing is about this, and um, we've got a caller calling into the show, and we're going to give a – and Betty, yes, let's give a copy of the book away, Um, 1-800-930-2819. But here's the thing I love. When that psychic talked to me and said that, it felt like coming home. It felt like something that I knew. Yeah. And I, I just curious for you, um, did you have encounters with psychics? Yeah. Did you uh, have medium. psychic experience? Medium. Yeah. So every medium psychic, but not every psychic's medium. So medium is a channel to talk to the other side. You know, mm-hmm. psychics can foretell things. You know, so there's so every psych every medium psychic, but not every psychic's a medium. So there is a difference and chan- and and it's it's kinda I didn't know. I knew it because I was immersed in this thing. So the first first medium I saw was before Chris ever passed away, and and so I don't know what it was about. I just had a curiosity, a need, a growth spiritual, you know, growth spurt. I don't know. But she, we'd gone through this reading, and most of it was pretty general. And I was thinking, ho hum. Then she said, "Your dad's here, and he's sending you railroad." He sent it. She said, "He's showing me a caboose." Now mm-hmm. nobody could know that our family was right. a railroad family, right? So, right. So you know, then it was like. And that was all. There wasn't a whole lot more. That was but just the saying he was there. And that was the old man, right? Iron Joe was just telling me he was there. Flash forward when Christopher crosses, I, I make an appointment with the medium because I want to do it in person. On the phone was lovely, but I wanted to do it in person. I walked in, and before I got there, I stopped at the grave and planted shamrocks around his loose dirt. It was still loose. You know, there's a, there's a story in the book that I, I actually moved him over one grave site because I was PO'd that he was buried next to somebody else, and that one will be my grave later on. But so I, while the, deuce, the, the the dirt was loose, I planted shamrock seeds around it, which for the first couple, you know, first year you could still see. And then I grabbed a leather bracelet out of a drawer he gave me when we were at Disney World when he was maybe three or four, three, and put that. I went and saw the psychic. And he walked in. And he said, "Chris acknowledges you were planting something today. What were you planting?" And I said, Shamrock. She goes, yeah, he acknowledged that, and that you're wearing the bracelet he gave you. Now, I got I had a jacket on. I didn't have, I didn't walk in with 30 knees and a handful of, uh, you know, of, 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 of dirt. You know, this couldn't have been. He said, your whole family was together last night celebrating some family celebration for you. What was it about? It was the, the, net, that, net, the day before was our 25th wedding anniversary, Sally and mine. So, and all of a sudden it was like, okay, I'm, Ten minutes in, and this is what we we're starting with. And so it was like, buckle up. This this is real. You know, this isn't mm-hmm. this isn't anything other than Chris communicating through this guy and a bunch of other stuff. We celebrated his birthday like we always did. We went to this Japanese restaurant and mm. we let go Chinese lanterns, which we did. It was like, wow, just yeah. amazing. So I was 
hook, line, and sinker at that point and haven't been disappointed yet. I know. I, I, I totally get it. Let's do this. We have a fabulous caller, Benny, joining us on the show today. Has a question for you, Joe. Uh, Benny, do we have Jay? Yeah, we have Jay from Canada. Hey, Jay, what's up? Hi, hey. Jay. Hey, hey, Jay. Hey, Dr. Pat. Hey, Joe. Oh, thanks for letting me be part of the show. I, I love you, you Jay. Love you, too. <laughs> I miss you, too. <laughs> Jeez, all those years been listening to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a great conversation. Uh, Joe, I got a question for you. Sure. Um, I've been actually involved in, uh, I lost my mother and I lost my uh, good friend this year, and I've been involved in like three different grief groups uh, throughout this fall. And I'm finding that the common thing regarding grief, um, that uh, when we say, I don't know, for me, I just like when people, uh, you say something to somebody, uh, you lost someone, they say, I'm sorry for your loss. But uh, for me, it's like I, I changed it now. So I'm, I, I'm, you know, I can't imagine how you're feeling. And I just wondered why is grief so kind of like isolated, but also unique, very unique to that individual, their stories, their experiences, and how they passed on. So just wonder what your thoughts about that is. So the question is, why is why do you think grief is so individual? Yeah, well, it's in the, it's it's very unique. In it for everybody, right? But I also find that it's very isolating that we kind of like when sure. someone passes on that we don't share our, our, you know, their their memories and things like that. And we become really isolated. And then we go into, you know, anxiety, depression, and then yeah, it can really you know, spiral into something bad. <laughs> or yeah, than, no, I get before. it, and and I yeah. think a lot has to do with the awkwardness of others. You know, like I remember. Sally didn't want to go to the grocery store in town because people would look down, right, and kind of look away, and she felt worse about it, you know. Um, you know, and, and, and another thing is my, my, my oldest pal, Alan Conrad, who just came down to visit. I'm here in, in Florida visiting my sister. And, uh, and so uh, when Alan's wife passed away 13, 14 years ago, he said, you know, uh, he and I were really reunited spiritually. And he said to me, can I give you some advice when Chris died? And my general answer is no. <laughs> you know, right. I don't yeah. advice. right. And I said, but from Al, I said, sure. You know, I knew he'd experienced a substantial loss. He said, look, the first six months after Debbie died, you know, people said stupid things. And I told them how stupid they were. And I let them know. He said, let's face it. We don't suffer fools, you and I. Gladly, much less at all. He said, so I broke a lot of bridges from people who just didn't know any better. He said, so if I can just urge you to have restraint of pen and tongue. You know, if somebody says something dumb, just smile and walk away. You know, he said, I spent a year making, trying to make up those friendships again. Um, he said, so you got to be tolerant of other people's ignorance. You know, and, and you're right. I like the, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. But I think when people are just trying to, to say something that, you know, they, they, they don't know what to deal with because nobody knows what, you know, what really, you know, goes on next. I, I have a true, true, true knowing about what's going on with my Christopher and, and the other side. But I don't know what's going on with your pal, you know, or how that experience is. So to pretend I do is, is, is arrogant. So, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for your pain, you know, and, uh, uh, but I think we, we just kind of kind of give people a pass because, because they're dealing with a subject that they have no idea what they're talking about, mm. you know, so God bless them, you know, just bless them and move on. Thank you. Thank you much for your yeah. wisdom and sharing today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Thank you Thanks, so Jay. much. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, Joe, I think that part of this, too, is, uh, by the way, Jay has been listening to the show for all 15 years. Nice. No kidding, right? Jay, get a book? Uh, uh, Benny, I think Benny was giving Jay a book. Good. Um, yeah, Benny, let's make sure Jay gets the book. Um, you know, so, I mean, this is one of these things for me that I, I sit here now like you, Joe, a little bit where I get to look back. Yeah. But it was so hard for me. By the way, 
that whole thing with, you know, the ninth station of the cross and yeah. yeah. Okay. So I ended up in with Dr. Jacoby. Okay. Because the images didn't go away. Right. You know, I walked home one day and I walked into our house in the Bronx and I uh, walked into our place and in there I saw what uh, could have been a, uh, a, a, I now know it was a picture of my mom, like in 1930 outfit with a hat, right? Right. And, but I didn't know it at the time, right? Because I'm young. I don't know what my mom looked like then. In her and, prime. Right. And I, what they were right in the kitchen, the whole thing. And I thought it was a real person. So I, I went to the neighbor and I said, there's somebody in my house and here I am now, mind you, I don't know what it was like for you, but when you live in the Bronx, my dad used to lock all the doors from the inside. There was only one way to go in. And that was the way I went in. And uh, nobody came out of the house. So the police shows up at my house, uh, like all the flashing lights. There's right. nobody in the house. The back door is not open. No broken windows. All the doors are locked. The windows are nailed down. That got me a number of visits with Dr. Jacoby. Sure right there. It did. They didn't know what to do with you. <laughs> but, you, you know, you know when you know. And I think that's what you're saying in the book. And you know, you know something else, Dr. Pat? You were yeah. sick, but your soul wasn't sick. Yeah. So you yeah. knew what you knew. I knew and, what I knew. And, and, and I also think the benefit now compared to then is the veil is thinning. Yeah. 70%, Dr. Pat, 70% of people have had some sort of encounter with the other side. 70. Yeah. 7 out of 10, yeah. right? So the bottom line is I was booking. We were doing a book signing in my home in my, where I live in Winnetka. And the guy who's, you know, handling the hall, you know, handling the community house hall, you know, said, can I talk to you? <laughs> and told me his experience, right? You know, I mean, everybody has a, a lot of people have a story. So do I really think, do I really, A, I don't care, and B, I really don't think there's this outcast concern for, uh, for you know, that this is such, such a, you know, an out there thought, you know, that, What's he talking about? I think truth matter is most people have had some sort of encounter, and maybe they just need a little reinforcement to say it happened. You know, this happened to you when you were six. This, this is real. This is the strength. This is your mom. When you cross over, you're walking from one, sliding a door over, walking from one room to another. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. What is, I, I want to talk about this. Sure. Uh, because I talked to my mom's. To this day. Right. I talk to them. I know that I'm alive today. Yeah. Uh, because of them. Yeah. In a lot of ways. I, I wanted you to share a little bit about your experience about that. Because not it, it isn't too often that I walk around and say, you know, I'm talking to my mom. But it's really clear to both Linda and I, Linda was very close to her mom, that there is a connection Tell us a little bit about your connection today. Okay. And, well, it's yeah. funny. Last night, so I'm visiting my sister, and last night I, I always connect with Chris for some reason on beaches at night in Florida. There's just a strong connection. So I was in Naples, yeah. sitting on a beach, having a cigar, talking to my son, feeling him around me, and I got this huge impulse to drive two hours north to Sarasota to Siesta Key, where it where said crystal, the sand isn't crystal. It's, I mean, it isn't sand. It's quartz crystal. It comes down from Appalachia. And so and I had connected with him there a couple of years before, in, two, in November 2016. I you know, made sure I had enough Red Bull, made sure I had a couple of cigars, headed up there, and to sit there and communicate with him. You know, and, and I will, and, and part of it, I, I laughed, like, because I think part of it was, I think he was turning to his buddies up and up and on the other side and saying, "See, I told you'd show up. You know, see, mm-hmm. I told you'd come." Um, so, so that's what you know. That was worth that connection for me. You know, I'm going to yeah. drive there, and so I'll do anything to feel that way. So when yeah. I need to talk to Chris, I have to. You know, I do the things that. 
open the lines. I, I burn sage. I mean, it sounds crazy. I do a candle at 3 o'clock in the morning when I'm communicating. Yeah. He wakes me up. I thought it was because between 3 and 4 is when he died, when he crossed over. And it's actually, that's a, kind of a witching hour for, for mm-hmm. spirits, that they're pretty active at 3 o'clock. Yeah. In the so I would get up, meditate, and then on his year anniversary of his death, so January 3rd, 2017, I picked up a pen, and, and, and I just got, a, it was like somebody dictating, hi, Pop, it's beautiful over here. You're, going, you're not going to believe it. You know, it's blues and green. It's always, mm-hmm. it's always warm. And I'm just writing. And now it's not automatic writing. I thought it was automatic writing until I was three-quarters way through the book. So I thought out that automatic writing is an entirely different thing where you go into a trance, that this is spirit writing. This is channel writing. You know, so this was... You know, him giving me messages and him saying things that, Pat, I wouldn't say, things that didn't originate with me, you know, things that, and, and that was kind of when I showed this to mediums like, you know, Thomas Johns, who's world renowned, Andrew Anderson, you know, uh, uh, Sherry Jewell. They all confirmed, oh, yeah, that's Chris. Yeah. And I said, well, you guys get to see him as well as hear him. How do I see him? And the general consensus was you probably won't that he communicates, you communicate with him better audibly, that's probably the gift, and just be grateful for it. And I don't want to be a medium. I don't want to see your family. I don't want to see my wife's family. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's not what I want to do. I just want to open lines of communication to my boy that I don't get to see every day. Yeah. You know, that I don't yeah. get to hug, that I can't tuck in anymore. Yeah. And so I, I have that. But I have, when I was uh, on the beach yesterday, I was just talking mm-hmm. to him. Yeah. I go to the grave. And I saw this guy, Thomas John, who, like I said, has his own TV series. And he said to me, you go to the grave all the time, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, you know, most parents, I tell them, don't do that. They don't go there. But I'm going to tell you that that's a great place for you two to connect. So I encourage you to continue to do that. I go there mm-hmm. with the Buffalo Bills folding chair. And I usually bring my dog, who got skunked a couple weeks ago doing that. Uh-huh. And, and I light a cigar, and, and, and I talk to him. I talk to him about my other kids. I talk to him about life i talked about the book which he's pushed me to write and would harass me sometimes and say hey you got to get going you need to help people you're going into a funk we can't afford this and other times he would say great job dad you're doing great you're going to help a lot of people mm-hmm. right you know the truth of the matter is i loved it when i made him happy on this side and i love it when i make him happy on the other side yeah yeah you know, this is for uh, for so many. For those of you just tuning in, uh, and I love, I love. First of all, I love the book, and Thank I you. felt like I was right there with you. Yeah, I, I did. I felt like I was right in the scenery, in the emotion of it, but also in what I call the enlightenment of it. Right. And the and then the heart connection of it. My search for Christopher on the other side. Joe, how do people get a copy of the book? How do they find out more about this, more about you, all of the above? Okay. First of all, the publisher who's my agent, who's Lisa Hagen. So Lisa Hagen Books is a website that you can look up stuff about this book. But the mm-hmm. book is available right now on Amazon, both in, in print and Kindle edition. Yep. Um, you know, it's a, it, yeah, I think it shows up in two days. They, they, they've got it down to a science. Um, you know, so the, the best thing is, get. I mean, I'll be putting up, this is my first run at this. I didn't wake up one day and say, I think I'm going to be an author. You know, <laughs> I, I was in business all my life, and I still am, right? Yeah. So, so uh, my search for Christopher on the other side, Amazon, I encourage you to pick it up. I think it's going to be reaffirming to some and enlightening to others. Mm-hmm. But either way, it's it's we're all going there, Dr. Pat. Yeah. You know, we may as well figure, try to try to look into what's, what that is. If, if yeah. I was going to Hawaii, I'd go online and see what do you do in Hawaii. Yeah. So if somebody's given me kind of a, a an opening, you know, it's you know it's like vacation rentals by owner or whatever for heaven. You know, this is what the other side, you know, for me and my son and our reality is. You know, so uh, I think it's I think it would be helpful for everybody. So Amazon is is one way, and then to, if you just want to check out dates and everything else, it's uh, Lisa Hagen, and, and I God bless Lisa. Christopher got his arms around her and wouldn't let her go. You mm-hmm. know, for somebody to write a book and have it published, you know, within 
you know, the same year yep. is beyond comprehension. It took it me is. just over a year to write it, and then, you know, six months later it's getting published. So, you know, th- there's got to be some, there's got to be some uh, factors pushing, pushing this envelope for us. Yeah, yeah, we we want to thank Christopher for that, too. Yeah, all day long. He's, he was a force of nature here, and he's over there, too. That's exactly right. Well, I, I I love the book. I love the book for a lot of reasons. First and foremost, and Jay, you're going to really appreciate it, is this, the writing of this is coming from a place that is indescribable. Right. You know, it doesn't come from some academic a lecture on how to write a book. It comes from a very sacred and powerful place from inside of you and from the connection that lives on today between you and Chris. Right. And there's nothing more powerful, I think, than that, which we call love. And he promised me that the minute I cross over, he'll be there. And he said, Dad, the learning curve for you is going to be a lot easier than for me. I was kind of shocked. You've got. I'm, tell, I'm. I'm. I'm updating you on what's going on, so it'll be real comfortable for you. So he's already made a deal. He's going to be there when I cross over. And heck, if he's there, how bad can it be? It's got to be good. It, did he ask you to bring cigars? No, he, he didn't. <laughs> but he'll know it's me because he'll smell them coming. Actually, Uh-oh. I smoke cigars at the grave just because I really do think that that just tips him off that I'm there. Well, you know, it's interesting because I come from a cigar smoking family. God bless you. And my mom, my stepmom, whenever my dad would go out, there we'd be with these cigars. Uh And, you know, I guess she didn't get it back in the day uh, that cigar smoking was just for men. Because (laughs) as as teenagers... We painted an entire house smoking cigars. So yeah, you I'll know what? You. What I love about that is your dad showed that, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I did yeah. the same thing with my with my, my little girl, Caroline, who's 22, that yeah. she came out to me at 16 and said, can I have a cigar? Because I was sitting out there with some friends in the backyard. I said, sure. Well, she had known that I had let Christopher smoke a cigar, and I always said, you know, it's equal rules across the board. And she just wanted to see if I was full of it or not. She had one cigar exactly. in her life. She'll never have another one. Um, she's laughed at me to this day, but it was like, yep, go pick out a nice light one and come on down. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, Joe, thank you. Thank you so very, very much. I thank really you, appreciate love it. I will send you an autographed copy because I really love the fact that you get it. Yes, I do. And actually, we're going to feature the book on our website and in our newsletter coming out. Perfect. So thank well, you so much. Thank you oh. so much. Wow. Uh, for those of you out there, this is a must read. Um, and for me, it is the kind of book that you think about and you say, who is in my heart that I want to share this with? My search for Christopher on the other side. I'm Dr. Pat. Uh, Joe McQuillan, joining me here today. And have fun at the beach, Joe. Yeah, I'm taking a flight home that today, doctor. So the beach time uh, is over. All right. Well, good. So maybe we'll meet up in New York and get some pizza. I, I, believe me. Believe me, oh. I'm in. Sign me up. Let's- All right, you bet. Let's take a short break, everyone. We'll be right back. The audio was via a Skype call.